gym is quite a depressing place really. <laughs> Just, you know, when you're there and there, there's like big guys like lifting massive weights and like, and you can't lift anything. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, welcome back to the vlog. I'm with Steve this morning. We're gonna film a Q&A today. I asked you guys to ask us some questions. You asked plenty of questions. We were gonna to ride to the cafe, but it's like horrendous weather today. So we're just gonna drive. The first question, do you have any tips for a competitive cyclist who's trying to balance the training and their GCSEs? Yeah, um, you'd write down like a pro, like um, a schedule. So you got when you have your exams, your revision, your social life your training but make your training specific if you're doing GCC you're 15 16 anyway so you don't need volume you just need um, you need specific stuff so it's gonna be shorter harder efforts a lot of turbo work this time of year so it'd be quite easy to program that in and around your exams yeah. Yeah. is that what you did um, no <laughs> don't do a side on um, before my uh, I remember before my maths GCSE, I rode a junior national series race, and then drove all the way back to Cornwall, um, and then maths GCSE the next day. I did alright in both, but not not mega. <laughs> <laughs> Was it worth it? Was it worth the sacrifice for training? Um, well, I'm not. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, yeah. Uh, well, I'm here talking to you, Cam, about yeah. cycling. <laughs> There's a lot of questions about power meters. So if, if you have a heart rate monitor, should you make the jump over to a power meter? Yes, definitely. Yeah. It's like having a mega stereo system, yeah. mega music system, and you've got little, little speakers. It's the only way of describing it. Yeah, you got like you spend all the money on the bike, you spend all the money on training. But if you have a power meter, everything is quantifiable. Yeah. yeah. Like, so it's kind of like a side question. Even for for people that aren't racing, or even for like elderly people, would you still recommend they need they need to have a power meter? Uh, they don't need to have a power meter, no. But if you're, you know, data driven, power meter is yeah. great tool. Um, it quantifies all riding you do. It's kind of, I, I think it's definitely worth having one. And I mean, now power meters are so much more accessible. You can get pedal based power meters at a reasonable cost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, don't have to spend the world on some SRMs or anything like that. So, yeah, I mean, it just makes training easier. Riding, yeah, it's not necessary to have it, but it's. If you can make the jump, do it. For both of us, when was your first bike race? <laughs> Mine was the 25th of April, 1996. Interesting fact, that was actually before I was born. <laughs> I can actually remember when my, my first bike race was, before I did road cycle and I raced BMX, so yeah. I, yeah, I don't even know. Probably when I was about six years old. Just a, it was just a local club mountain bike race. Yeah. My introduction to sport. So you started racing mountain bikes? Before yeah, I did, I did mountain bikes for three years yeah and then I got a road bike and started riding and somebody says oh no somebody said get a road bike you, you train we go better I was riding a national level mountain bike races and started doing that and then riding with a local club and somebody said oh why don't you start road racing what is the best way like, how to, how do you prepare and target for a time trial it depends on the distance let's take a club 10 for example club 10 work but always work backwards from the goal it doesn't matter if it's club 10 it's massive sporty for a road race. Always work backwards from that goal. So it's unlikely you're going to go to a time trial without an, any kind of aim. So whether you want to break a certain time or you know beat your mate or something, you're always going to have a, an ambition in that race. So work backwards. So day before, don't do too much. Day before that, a little bit of a rest. Build up steadily for the race. You can best way for time trials you know a lot of threshold work over threshold work um, but it's all obviously all power meter based um, I'd ride <clears throat> I do a lot of when I rode the National 10 I had short preparation for it but I, I did a lot of um, sort of five ten minute efforts at sort of 10, 10 watts 20 watts over my threshold and just getting used to making that repeatability so I could get to the time trial and just go flat out with it that period of time at that wattage. Okay, so this one's from Adam. He says, I know Steve does a lot of cross. Does he do any other disciplines? And if he does, how does he alter his training for them? I don't do any other disciplines. Oh, road, time trials, obviously. Um, cross, I just do it for fun in the winter. I, yeah. I enjoy racing. I enjoy getting muddy, bizarrely. But I won't touch my cross bike from one week to the next. Um, at the minute, they're in my car and they'll probably stay there till Saturday. <laughs> but I don't do anything specific, especially this time of year, like my training. I'm in a progression period of my training. I'm, my training now is just getting used to being able to train come December, January time. So I'm doing no specific work. I'm just 
doing some, you know, some strength work, but nothing specific on the cross bike, no intervals or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. It's just the racing is taking care of itself. So I guess the next question, kind of leading on with the strength work, should you periodise your weightlifting in the off season? Alternatively, do most pros forego any weightlifting or strength training during the off season? Not, hey, a lot, no one foregoes it, a lot of people do it. I do it, um, working on my legs, lower back, any imbalances, um, do my core. I find it easier to go, if I'm at the gym and I can do some strength training, gym strength training, then I can do my core after. It's, um, because I can't do my core at home, I just start looking at my phone and just laying on the floor and watching TV. But um, I think, like I know a well-known British professional rider, sprinter, um, he does a lot of gym work all season long and it'd be quite interesting to see if gym work really progresses onto your cycling, whether you're a sprinter, climber, ruler, um, I think it would help but I've yet to try it. Yeah, and uh, so, so at this time of year, how many times a week would you be going to the gym? Twice a week. There's no no need to go to more of them because an internet cracks. It's quite a, the gym is quite an depressing place really <laughs> Just, you know when you're there and there there's like big guys like lifting massive weights and like and you can't lift anything yeah <laughs> so cycling central ask at what age would you recommend to start following a structured training program as soon as you can really it, like uh, i started cycling at, well i started racing when i was 12 years old and i followed a structured plan from then because you do you know i was at school till 3 30 playing with my mates football after you know it was football training in the week so you only had limited time to follow training anyway so but in terms of time it was structured in terms of what I'd done it wasn't but we didn't have the knowledge then so um, as soon as you can really as soon as you feel you want to progress in the sport follow it properly I mean there's a lot to be said for just going out riding the bike but there's a lot to be said for sticking to a specific plan training properly um, you know, doing the correct things on a turbo trainer or rollers or out on the road. And especially this time of year, you know, if you're going to sit on a turbo trainer in the evening for an hour, you just as well follow a, a plan um, as just as opposed to the pedaling away. Lone Wolf asks, other than sweet spot efforts, what sort of training should you be doing at this time of the year? It's November, not a lot. 15, 16 hours maximum. Like, you don't want to be, like, there's some guys do it for 30 hours, that's just mad. Um, doing FTP efforts and stuff. You, you it's, a, we're five months away from the races, so this time of year, I would be, I personally, I'm doing um, what we do, STE efforts, so long, so they're like 60 RPM building muscle for five minute efforts. Um, all zone three, 20 minute zone three efforts. Um, no, nothing harder than zone three because your body, when you start doing top end work, anything over threshold, your body adapts very, very quickly to it. So if you start doing that now, you, you, it's six weeks and you're going to be absolutely flying. Six weeks time is first week in January. You know, you're, we're not racing for another two months after that. So there's no point. And that window, and then once you get that form, the window to hold that form is quite small anyway. Yeah. So what is the point of being flying in January? Yeah, so whilst we're on the subject of FTP, uh, when, another question is, when <coughs> when and how often should you test your FTP? Um, difficult one. I don't test it <laughs> because I'll crack myself, you know, when I'm only doing... Because it's so hard. Yeah, it's horrible effort to do. Um, I'll probably have a, um, a test in a few weeks' time just to see where I'm at which is quite regular for me. And then I'll do one in like March, April time just to see where I'm at. But other than that, no. Yeah, but then I, in come the season, I'm racing a lot of time trials, club tens and stuff. So you can see okay, where the threshold is anyway. Yeah. But when you're on a time trial bike, your thresholds, the number is lower because you're aero and you're in your racing yeah. kit and, and all that jazz. So, but it, you, the number is still relevant to, to you and what you can do. How important are what are your views on structuring your training in cycles or periods of three to four weeks hard followed by an easier recovery week? Yeah, um, I would extend the weeks. I'd do like four or five weeks. Yeah, but is that just because like you and you're obviously you've been riding for a long time? If there's a younger rider, would you still say they need to sort of do, do four or five weeks? I think hard? if you're not, if you, I think if you're an under sixteen, then maybe four weeks, for well, three weeks hard, one week easy. But as soon as you get beyond that and you've built a bit more of a base, you could do five weeks and then an easy, easier week. And an easy week's only like five days, just day off or an hour pedaling, no, no, no stress. Yeah. Um, I, I go, on, I work on five week 
um, cycles with an easy week every six week and then just go on that cycle all year round. Okay. Is it still possible to be competitive training with heart rate? I think I think what I'm trying to say is like, is it still, you know, can you still be a competitive cyclist and train properly with a heart rate monitor rather than a power meter? Mm, yes, but no, not you're not going to get the best out of yourself. Heart rate fluctuates daily. Yeah. Um, you know, temperature affects heart rate. Fatigue, obviously, massive factor on heart rate. Um, you know, whether you if you've had three coffees in the day, your heart rate can be elevated. Yeah. It's it's too much of a vague ballpark to be playing in. Um, power meter makes everything quantifiable, and also if you're if you can do a zone two ride at 180, 200 watts, and you're struggling to do that, then obviously you know you're fatigued. Or if you're doing, say, you have your zone four threshold efforts of 350 watts then and you can't hold that number then you know you're fatigued whereas a heart rate it doesn't show you that instantaneously Brandon asks does Steve follow and administer a traditional periodization program yes and no I do as in I work so when the can racing calendar comes out I work I like my A aims my B aims C aims and I work backwards from them like with rest periods but the last sort of three seasons I've done reverse periodization so November I'll start my, my, my training, my riding, just getting fit enough to train. December I'll start training with various efforts and intervals. Um, one reason is because the weather's so rubbish in the UK, why do you need to be spending more than three hours outside on your bike? Um, and the other one is I'm 33 so it's not, I, I'm not going to lose a race because I can't ride 180k. I'm going to lose a race because I can't ride fast for that particular minute and I think now training has changed so much that that's less of the on vogue thing to do but at the same time you need a good big base to be able to start doing that sort of training yeah you know I've, I've had years of training the you know, long distance miles etc etc so if you look you know a lot of people can follow me on Strava and on their my average week's 16 hours a week because I'm not doing massive hours this time of year or, or even until I get to Calpe in January. Then I'll start doing some five, maybe a couple of six hour rides a, a week, but there's no need to. I don't ask, which bike are we going to be riding? Can we say that? Yeah, what bike we're going to be riding? Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to be on mint bikes next year. Conago C60s, Campag, group sets, mint equipment. So we just had to pause this Q&A for 20 minutes, the camera overheated. Good job, Sony. How much of an improvement would someone else would someone see by following a structured training program compared to someone just riding steady miles? Will there be a significant jump in your FTP or will it just improve their aerobic capacity? It's a massive increase in your uh, ability performance. But it's not all about FTP. Like a lot of riders get hit up in this whole what what are my FTP is X X, Y, or Z, but it's everything else. It's your one minute, your five minute, you know, how fast you can go. Yeah. Um, you're not racing up 20 minute climbs. Yeah. And what you can do at the end of a race. Yeah, so, you know, if you can do a sprint at the end of a race, or if you can't, you know, if you've got like a, a lot of guys who've got a mega FTP can't sprint, so, so there's a big trade off. Yeah. But following a structured training plan, you would improve massively, massively. So I don't mean to rush in there, I've got some booking coming on this table in the next five minutes. So they're obviously here now, I'm just having some drinks while they're waiting. Okay, right. okay, okay. cool. Yeah. What type of training was Steve doing before he became pro compared to the current times? I've been... Yeah, so when I was an amateur, I was racing in Spain. So I was full-time then anyway, so I didn't really have to structure my training around a job. Apart from winter times, I used to have to work. Then I got my first power meter in 2008. So essentially from then, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, I was, I was juggling cycling, training and work. So made everything quantifiable. I could train specifically to numbers for short periods of time. There's no junk miles. Um, yeah, I think I think now it's just become more it's training has become more specific instead of hours and miles. I've been cycling seriously for two years now and my FTP is still in the low two hundreds. How long should I wait before I start racing? As soon as you get into a race enter it. Because racing will push you on more so than training because you're gonna go 
harder because the ego won't allow you to be beaten by riders, um, no matter what you say or who you say you are. Um, you were, and it, it's a gauge, you don't know how good you are until you actually race. Yeah. So just get racing, do it. How much does natural ability or genetics matter in making it to the pro tour level? And can someone with poor genetics still train hard and make it as a professional? I know riders who are so talented it's untrue but their work ethic is abysmal because it's easy come easy go so if you're if you maybe you're the most talented guy in the world and you've got mega work work ethic then you're going to make it peter sagan for instance um but there's a lot of guys who get by through just training hard, training specifically, grit, you know, they've got, every rider's got some talent, you shouldn't be doing it, but if you've got passion, you've got drive, determination, you're going to go a lot further than guys with just talent and can't really be asked to train, oh, it's raining outside, can't bother to do, you know, you're going to get further than that. So Jason asks, I've just bought a power meter, uh, I'm going to be doing crits next season, what sort of intervals are best suited for this type of racing? An hour at zone three, we sprint every two minutes. I mean, that's probably the best thing, it's just like Rip King going out of corners, riding hard. Um, you can mix it up like five minute efforts, three minute efforts, you know, three by one efforts times five. There's so much you can do, but a good hour with just lots of kicks, sprint, big sprints. Because there's no such thing as bad training, there's just bad application of training. So if you haven't got a coach, it's very easy to look at your training and think, well, I'm going to do, I'm going to do four. Uh, 20 minute efforts and you can't do the third one so you beat yourself up and then you still try and do the fourth one and you get yourself all in a stress about it and you've got no one to talk to it's, you know then you next day you try and do the same session again because you beat yourself up that's where a coach comes in and says right actually look you've done three good ones you can now rest recover you know you can do this tomorrow you do something else tomorrow and then we can revisit that next week or next month it's just the ability to change things up, you know, instantly, um, and just to tell you how to do things in the correct way, rather than yourself, your inner chimp saying, oh, I haven't done this right, I haven't done that right. So now, like, you personally started to focus more on the coaching side, coaching your eyes. Like, what, what is your aim? What do you want to get out of this? What is your end goal? There's no end goal. I like to see riders. I like to help riders who are determined. I like. To, it's kind of putting something back into the sport. Like, I had people helping me throughout my career so it's kind of doing that I like to see progression in riders as well so I like to see them improve get their goals get their aims and ambitions um, and achieve that so that's kind of what I like I like to see that I like sharing my experiences saying you know do as I say not as I've done so, um, you know I know what works in, in with training with training and I like to see you know the end goal of what, you know, what somebody can achieve doing the right thing. And that concludes the Q&A session with Steve. It was great to get him to sit down and really talk in depth in some in some details, talking about training and getting his advice on a number of different subjects. If anyone would like more information regarding the services, that the, the coaching services that Steve offers, check out the link in the description down below. You know, if you're serious about your training, if you really want to get fit for 2018, I recommend you click the link down below and give it a read. But guys, that's the end of today's video. If you want me to do more of this kind of stuff, drop a thumbs up. And as always, I'll see you tomorrow at 5 p.m.